Mina, Ohio Gazimus, Jesus Freaking Gamer here, doing the 30 minute message a day late, which is, well, I guess pretty normal for me. Heck, it may not even be a day late, I may just be getting ready to go to bed for Sunday. Cause that's also normal for me, cause I'm just a weirdo. Today, covering a very touchy subject, something a lot of people do not like to talk about, as you saw in the title. What is the tithe? What is tithing? What does that mean? What does that entail? How does it apply to the church today? Because I know one of the big reasons a lot of people don't go to church, and I hope, I really hope, uh, I know the 30-minute messages aren't particularly loved on YouTube. I know a lot of people don't want to take 30 minutes of their time to look into a subject. I hope a few people will click on this because tithing is a really, really big deal to a lot of people. It's the reason some people won't go to church. It's the reason some people have left church altogether. And I'm not trying to excuse what the church has done. I'm also not here to apologize for what the church has done, unless I think she has done something wrong. What I want to do is give a clear and accurate biblical representation of what tithing is, what it entails. So what I hope to answer today, um, at least in part, I want to I answer first and foremost, what is the tithe? What is that? Um, what are the practical implications for the tithe? You know, what did it mean in the Old Testament times? What does it mean in the New Testament times? Who is wrong in their perception of the tithe? The church? The non-Christian? Or maybe a little bit of both? So let's dive into that, shall we? Fun subject today. Now, I'm, uh, today is going to be a lot of Bible reading. Today, what I'm going to mainly focus on is the Old Testament. I've, actually, I've already planned this for, to be a two-parter. I know how I like to ramble. I know how I like to explain. I know how I like to talk. And based on the verses that I looked up, I believe this is going to be a two-parter. Like, positive it's going to be. And I'm pretty sure that I have enough material to cover an entire hour on this subject. 30 minutes of pop in two parts. So let's dig into this. So first thing we're going to, the way I've broken this up is today we're going to look into the Old Testament. We're going to look at literally every single verse in the Old Testament on tithing. And now some of you are wondering, can that even be done in 30 minutes? I mean, that's like, that's a lot of stuff, right? That's a big deal, right? Well, follow me as we dig deep into this rabbit hole. First, we're going to kick, off, kick it off with the most often used verses about tithing that the church well, it uses. That sounded kind of weird. Anyway, it's Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Malachi is the very last book in the Old Testament, and it's right before Matthew. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. And if you've been in church, like ever, you've probably heard this. Maybe not. Maybe you didn't. Maybe if you've only been once or twice, you didn't. You weren't there the one or two times where this verse was discussed. But have you ever heard a sermon on giving? And I've been in church for over 20 years now. I've heard quite a few. And this verse comes up almost every single time. I've heard it a lot. So let's hit this up first. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and pour out for you such blessing, that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed. For you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. So there it is. The classical verses used. Usually verses 11 and 12 aren't mentioned. I thought I'd throw those in just because those are a bit important. It's kind of like, you know, you've robbed me. Bring the time in the storehouse. Try me this. See if I won't bless you. Um, I'll, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Nor shall your vine fail to bear fruit. And all nations will call you blessed. I mean, those are some ad additional, very strong benefits to the tithe. Now, for, now there is no definition of what exactly is a tithe. I need to knock that out very first. A tithe is very simply a tenth. The word tithe itself means a tenth. One tenth. So, one dollar out of ten dollars. 
$10 out of $100, $0.90 out of $9, $0.65 out of $6.50. Divide whatever the grand total is by 10, and boom, that number, you got your one-tenth, you've got your tithe. And I'm not going to go into a ton of details on like, you know, how, well, I, actually, I'm going to go into details on how tithing works today. Uh, but I, I was like, I was like, yeah, I'm going to talk about that. I was going to, there are some details about the tithe that are very, very, very specific and minutiae. I'm probably not going to cover that. I also don't believe I need to, which will become more evident as time goes by in this message. So we're talking about a tenth. Bring the tithes into his storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me in this. A lot of preachers will say this is the only time in the entire Bible where God says to try him. I didn't honestly look that up before this message because that wasn't the main focus of this message. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. I don't know. Uh, but, but nonetheless, we are most definitely told in this verse, to tr he actually commands you to try him in this, where you, you don't typically want to presume upon the Lord or tempt the Lord or push the Lord or test the Lord. Here you are commanded to try him on this. Test him out. See if he won't bless you in return. That kind of deal. So the next question to, in my mind, and, I'm not, and I've never heard a preacher cover this, not once. What did a tithe look like in the Old Testament? You know, what, you know that we're ta looking in the book of Malachi, or in one of the prophets, but the prophets are not the law. The law is what details how things should be done, what the rules are for the Old Testament. Since this was done prior to Jesus' coming, since this was done in the BCs, what would a tithe have looked like in the nation where they were commanded to tithe? What did that mean? There are some things that are tied into the tithe here, and that's what I want to look into next. What did this look like to ancient Israel at the time of this writing? First, let's go to Leviticus chapter 27. So that is the third book in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 27. That's actually the last chapter in the book of Leviticus. Leviticus 27, verses 30 through 33. Leviticus 27, verses 30 through 33. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wants at all to redeem any of his tithes, he shall add one-fifth to it. <clears throat> And concerning the tithe of the herd or the flock, or whatever passes under the rod, the tenth one shall be holy to the Lord. He shall not inquire whether it is good or bad, nor shall he exchange it. And if he exchanges it at all, then both it and the one exchanged for it shall be holy. It shall not be redeemed. So we have some very specific rules as to what the tithe is here. We know a tithe means a tenth. That's simply the definition of the word, one tenth. And the tithe came from the fruit of the land. Back in the day, every single civilization was was um, ruralized. It was it was farming. It was not urban. It was not industrial. Even the urban um, centers of that time, it was on a agricultural society. There was no industrialization back then. It was all it was all um, it was all agricultural. And as someone who lives in America. That doesn't seem to really apply to me. Like, I'm not a farmer. I don't till the land. I have no herds. I have no seed. I have no fruit. I have no grain. I have none of these things. However, I can see where, you know, what I, well, what I do have is money, right? I mean, I, I make a pay, I, I work a job. I make a paycheck. And that can certainly be divided into tenths. So that's not necessarily an excuse what I will say is, what I will add to all of this is we also don't have a temple priest system. Um, nowadays, for Christians, we go to church. Um, regardless of whether you're in an agricultural first world society or in an industrial, I'm sorry, an industrial first world society, there are some agricultural parts to the United States, obviously. We have farmers here, otherwise we wouldn't have food. I guess we could import it all, but that'd be expensive. We still farm a good deal of our own food. Or whether you live in an agricultural third world country. <clears throat> there is no priesthood. There is no temple or tabernacle. Those things don't exist anymore. 
Now one could say, well, can't you just take your one-tenth, which is money, to the church, which, you know, isn't a temple, but it's the church. Couldn't you do that? Well, let's keep on reading. Let's get some, so we have details on the tithe here. That is the flock, that is the seed, and the fruit. You could even redeem some of this tithe. Um, to redeem a tithe, honestly, I didn't look into that either before going into this message. But it's kind of like, you know, redeeming a tithe sounds like you're going to take it back. So it's kind of like, well, I want to keep this one, so let me give, you know, this tenth plus a fifth to it. Then I'll keep this initial tithe. So it's it sounds kind of a, uh, you know, that, that doesn't seem to be applicable to us either. The tabernacle, temple, priest system really doesn't apply to us today. And the redeeming system, it doesn't sound like that really could apply to us. You know, if I want... You know, let's say I made $100, and I'm supposed to give 10 but I want to keep that 10 so I'm going to give $15. Um, well, actually, that that's, um, is that one? I think, that, yeah, that should be one-fifth. If I did my math wrong, uh, feel free to criticize me in the comments below. Um, pretty, pretty sure I did that, right? Just off the top of my head. So, yeah, I'm going to give you 15 to keep the 10 That makes zero sense. That makes absolutely no sense at all. So, I don't see that particular principle being applicable at all to today. In fact, I'm not even sure how that would work back then. Maybe, I was like, maybe the first part of the seed and the fruit of the land, it's, maybe it's supposed to, the, the tithe is the first tenth. Kind of like on every tenth animal was part of the tithe. Maybe the, and I know the tithe was generally considered to be the first fruits of the land. So it's like, I want to keep some of the first fruits. Let me give part, let me give a little bit more of the later part of my, of my, you know, income or increase of the year so I can keep the beginning part because they prefer the beginning part. Maybe they thought it was better. I'm not sure exactly how that works to be completely honest with you. That's also something I didn't look up <clears throat> because I wanted to make sure I covered and hit on all the verses in the Old Testament in regards to tithing. Maybe I should have gotten these details. Um, and if you're interested, I'm not sure if I'm really going to cover that because as I wrap this up, I don't believe it's going to be important. Please keep on watching if you are curious. Let's look at a little bit more about our... Actually, no, this is not an instruction on the tithe. This was the first tithe given. Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Genesis obviously being... Well, maybe not obviously. It's obvious to me because I've done this for so long, and a lot of people know it even though they're not Christians. Genesis is the first book of the Bible. Genesis 14, 18, 18 through 20. If you didn't know that, don't be ashamed. If it wasn't obvious to you, don't be ashamed. It's always good to get involved in God's stuff, in Bible stuff, regardless of when it is in life. If you've never heard of it, since it's not obvious to you, don't worry. If you decide to stick around and learn a little bit more, over time, Genesis being the first book in the Bible, will be obvious to you. So this is the first tithe recorded, Genesis 14, 18 through 20. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, that is Abraham, gave him, that is Melchizedek, a tithe of all. And that's really all that's mentioned. Um, I can't infer any commandment to us from that. I can't really infer even an example given to us like someone comes to bless us, so we give them a tenth of something. That doesn't seem to be really applicable to any situation I can think of. So rather than being an instruction to us, it just seems to be a story. You know, this is something that Abraham did. Or at the time, Abram. This is something that Abram did to Melchizedek, king of Salem. Melchizedek, king of Salem, and the priest of God, blessed him. And so Abraham, in return for that blessing, gave him a tenth of the spoils of the battle he had just been in. So the reason I mention this, it really doesn't lay down what a tithe is for us. It's just the first mentioning of it. And I'm certainly not getting into Melchizedek or the whole, you know, he was the high priest and the king of Salem bit. That is not related to the tithe at all. That's another subject entirely for another day. But it was the first mention of it, so I wanted to bring it out in this little study here. Next, we're going to look at Numbers 18, verses 21 through 32. Numbers is the fourth book in the Old Testament, right after Leviticus. So Numbers chapter 18, <clears throat> verses 21 through 32. Now that is reading quite a bit. 
Let's go. Behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Israel as an inheritance in return for the work which they perform, the work of the tabernacle of meeting. Um, a quick explanation on that. The, the uh, tribe of Levi wasn't counted among the 12 tribes of Israel. Joseph's two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, they were counted not as the tribe of Joseph, but as the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim, two tribes. Levi wasn't counted among the 12 because their inheritance was strictly the Lord. They didn't even have um, land or possession in the promised land. They had cities scattered throughout the 12 tribes of Israel. And they took care of a particular family within Levi, and that would be um, Aaron's family, Aaron the brother of Moses. Aaron's family was the priestly family. The, all the priests, including the high priest, came from Aaron and his family. And their brethren, the Levites, the tribe from which they came, they played a supporting role in taking care of the priests and the tabernacle and the sacrifices and everything in regards to the religious system of the Old Testament. They took care of all that stuff, all the cleaning, all the prepping, and probably all sorts of other things that are not mentioned anywhere in the Word of God. They, they were the assistants to Aaron and his family, the priests. So that's a, a little bit of backstory there in regards to, the, you know, the duty they perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting. That's what that means. Now, to proceed with the verses, verse 22. And following, hereafter, the children of Israel shall not come near the tabernacle of meeting, lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall perform the work of the tabernacle of meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever, throughout your generations, that among the children of Israel they shall have no inheritance. For the tithes of the children of Israel, which they offer up as a heave offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites as an inheritance. Therefore I have said to them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance." Kind of like what I was just saying a minute ago. Verse 25, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak thus to the Levites, and say to them, When you take from the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them as your inheritance, then you shall offer up a heave offering of it to the Lord, a tenth of the tithe. So a tenth of the tenth, essentially. And your heave offering shall be reckoned to you as though it were the grain of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the wine press. Thus you shall also offer a heave offering to the Lord from all your tithes which you receive from the children of Israel. And you shall give the Lord's heave offering from it to Aaron the priest. Of all your gifts you shall offer up every heave offering due to the Lord from all the best of them, the consecrated part of them. So whatever they got from the children of Israel, they were to take the best of that, um, take, uh, basically divide it all up, divide a tenth of it up, make sure that tenth is the best of everything they have, and that was the part that was given to the Lord, the consecrated part of it. And then in verse 30, Therefore you shall say to them, whoop, When you have lifted up the best of it, then the rest shall be accounted to the Levites as the produce of the threshing floor and as the produce of the winepress. You may eat it in any place, you and your households, for it is your reward for your work in the tabernacle of meeting. And you shall bear no sin because of it when you have lifted up the best of it. But you shall not profane the holy gifts of the children of Israel, lest you die. So, so they bore the iniquity of the tabernacle. Um, and what I, was, I said, the way I interpret that, I was like, the iniquity of the tabernacle, what does that mean? In other words, the children of Israel were sinners. They came there to present their trespass and sin offerings. And you couldn't get but so close to God in the Old Testament, otherwise you would die. Only the high priest was allowed into the Holy of Holies once a year. Only the priests were allowed into the, um, I want, was it the priests and the Levites allowed into the holy place? I don't know off the top of my head. Were the Levites allowed in the holy place or was that just the priests? I know in the outer court, that's where all of Israel gathered. And most of the ministering would be done there. I'm just not sure about the holy place off the top of my head. But because of the fact, you know, that Israel was sinners, because of the fact that they did offer sin offerings and that you couldn't get but so close to the Lord because you were a sinner, that's what it meant to bear the iniquity of the tabernacle. You know, a bunch of sinners have built it. A bunch of sinners come into it regularly. Therefore, the high priest, you know, does his once a year sin offering. They offer their regular sin offerings. And to be near the holy things consecrated to the Lord, you needed a people set apart, a people who could bear that iniquity. Thus, the Levites. 
and of course the priest as well to a greater capacity. And the offering of the, the offering of the children of Israel was considered holy, but since they bore the iniquity of the tabernacle, since they were supposed to work there, there was no sin, like it says in verse 32, and you shall bear no sin because of it, when you have lifted up the best of it. So you lift up the best part, you take out a tenth of their tenth that they gave to you, you offer up that best part there, and then you don't worry about eating the rest of it, consuming the rest of it. There is no sin in you because of it. But just make sure you don't profane those holy gifts. You know, keeping the best parts to yourself, not giving quite a tenth, but, you know, just a little bit shy of it, you know, and giving just a little bit less than your absolute best, you know, making sure some of the best part, just a little bit of it was kept over for you. You know, don't be dishonest. Do everything the way I've commanded you to, and, do, and, you know, and then you won't have profaned anything. Do as I have commanded, essentially is what the Lord was saying there. So that, that's where the tithe was used. That's, it was an offering from the people, and it was used by the Levites. And, that, and there is yet one more section of Scripture in regards to the tithe in the Old Testament. This is Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy is right after Numbers. Fifth book in the Old Testament, the last book in the Torah, as a matter of fact. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Verses 22 through 29. Told y'all lots and lots of reading today because I wanted to cover the tithe very, very thoroughly and what exactly this meant. You shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. That the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe. Or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you. Because, of course, the tabernacle was one very specific location. I forget where it was off the top of my head, but the tribe of Israel, the twelve tribes, they covered a pretty good chunk of land there in the Middle East. And there were no planes, there were no cars back in the day. You And I don't... I could be wrong. I don't think even horses were commonplace among the people. Horses were reserved for, like, the king and his army or very wealthy men. Um, most people, they had to hoof it. Or maybe they, if they had a donkey to ride, then they had that. But donkeys aren't the fastest critters in the world. They certainly take the burden off of you because they're carrying you instead of you having to walk yourself. That's not the quickest ride in the world. So they weren't just able to, like, easily journey from one end of Israel to the other. So, back, just going to start over at verse 24 again. But if the journey is too long for you, so that you are not able to carry the tithe, or if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand, and go to the place which the Lord your God chooses. And you shall spend that money for whatever your heart desires, for oxen or sheep, for wine or similar drink. For whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. You shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. At the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates, may come and eat and be satisfied, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. So not only was the tithe given to the Levites, it was also something that the people themselves could consume, or if they lived too far away, they'd sell it for money and then take that money to the tabernacle or the temple, and there they would eat before the Lord. And also, of course, you know, the Levite got his share, and apparently every third year, the fatherless and the widow, and I, it doesn't mention this, so this could just be an assumption, but generally when the fatherless and the widow are mentioned, it also refers to the poor, to those who do not have. There were several laws in place in, in the law of Moses in the Old Testament to try to take care of the poor of the land. So that may, I'm just guessing, could be wrong, but I'm guessing that may be a part of this tithe as well. So that was a time to come before the Lord and just enjoy yourself, to just eat before him, to be in his presence, to be amongst his people, to be among his servants, the Levites, and his servants, the priests. It was a time of rejoicing, of literally feasting and drinking. And that was another part of the tithe. Um, 
And now, believe it or not, that is actually all the information the Old Testament has about tithing. There are other verses that mention the tithe, but they are, in mentioning, they are always mentioned into either you need to repent because you haven't upheld these rules, or, you know, remember, keep a hold of these rules, you know, d don't forget these, make sure you do this as well, or it was a reiteration of these rules. There was no new information on tithing in the Old Testament. That was it. That was everything. And so the conclusion that I have come to based on reading this is that because of the system that the tithe was involved in, I do not believe tithing really applies to us today. I don't see how it can. There's no, it, The whole system of tithing was wrapped up in the priesthood and the Levites who took care of the priesthood and the tabernacle where the priest height where the priest heights where the priest and the Levites ministered before the people and before the Lord. That system doesn't exist anymore. So I don't see how a tithe really is applicable. Um, I would say that we need to look into the New Testament to see what it has to say about the tithe. And let me and let me I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and give a little bit of a spoiler here. The New Testament if it mentions the word tithe, it's somehow in reference to the Old Testament system. So the New Testament really has no new commands on tithing. But that doesn't mean that doesn't mean when you go to church, don't give anything. All the preachers are greedy. Everyone's a liar and a crook. And they're just trying to take money from you. That's not what that means. The New Testament definitely makes room for giving, not only to the poor, but to ministry and ministers as well. That is a thing that is mentioned, so you're not off the hook. And if somewhere in your heart you hold it against the church that they're asking you for money, now if you've been extorted or something, yes, the church was certainly at fault for extorting to you or for lying to you. That is wrong, that is a sin, and probably a crime depending on where you live, which you can take them to the, to the court for and sue them and get them legally punished. But if the church is simply asking you for money, that in and of itself is not wrong. If you don't want to give a single penny, if you don't want, if you're, if in your heart you don't want to give anything, then I want to suggest to you that there is something wrong with you. You have a heart problem. So don't take all of this of what I've just said as, oh, the tithe, really it's Old Testament centered, it's really about the priesthood and the Levites and the tabernacle, so I don't really have to give anything since that stuff doesn't exist anymore. No. It's not how that works. If you, if you are angry and upset and offended by the thought of having to give a penny to the church or to a preacher, there is a heart problem there. And I'm going to cover all the New Testament giving and a little bit more on the heart problem in the part two of this message. So hang tight for that. Look forward to that or not. <laughs> if I could encourage you, though, if, you, if you're offended by that thought, Please, if you've wait, given me this 30 minutes, thank you so much for that. I would implore you and beseech you, please give me that other 30 minutes. When that other message comes out, please give me a chance to talk to you again. I believe that there's something really good about giving. I believe there is something really good about giving in New Testament these times right now that we benefit from, that is good for us, that opens up our heart to the Lord and our fellow man in a way that other things just don't quite do. When you give a part of your, when you give of your money, it's kind of like you're giving a part of your heart and a part of yourself. Now, money is something very intricately woven into the heart of man. It's money is very, very important to us. So when you're when you're not willing to let go of that, there's something wrong. And when you are willing to let go of that, there is benefit. There is blessing there. And finally, as I always wrap up these 30-minute messages, I want to give anyone who has not had a chance to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that chance right here, right now, because that, in my opinion, is the most important thing. So if you're not a Christian at all, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, can I encourage you, won't you do that right now? Some of you know, even though this message wasn't about salvation or about the cross, you know you need God, you know you need Jesus, and don't wait, any, don't wait another minute, don't wait any longer. Right now, commit your life to God. Commit your life to the Lord. You know you want to. You know you need to. And I promise you, that is a decision you will not regret. Talk about giving. I'm talking about giving it all now. Give the Lord everything. Your heart, your mind, your soul. 
and trust everything to him. Let him save you. Let him redeem you. Let him be your Lord, your God, your master. Because he loves you so much, he died on the cross for you. He did that for you. That's how much he loves you. This is a guy you can trust. This is a guy you can give everything to. There is no one more trustworthy or more dependable than him. And if you yeah, and you don't need my words to do it, you can come to the Lord however, however you see fit. If you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, and that he rose again from the third day, that's all you need. But if you do want words, if you want a model prayer to pray, pray this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. I believe you died on the cross and rose again from the dead for my sin and so that I could be with you in heaven forever. I accept you, Jesus, right now as my personal Lord and Savior. And thank you for hearing this prayer and for coming into my heart right now. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, Congratulations, you are now a Christian, you are a son or a daughter of the Most High, and you are a member of the church. Welcome to the family. It is good to have you. If I could encourage you, pick up this book which I was covering today and read just a little bit every single day to get to know this new God of yours, this new Father in your life. This is his love letter to us. These are his thoughts, his heart on paper to you and to me. You want to get to know him? Read that. Study that. Make that a part of your daily life. Let me encourage you to do that first and foremost. Secondly, find a group of people who believe the same thing that you do. That Jesus is God. He's Lord. He died on the cross and rose again. And the Bible is the Word of God. Generally, you're going to find these people at a church. Go church hunting. Go church shopping. Find a place and a group of people who believe those things that you also believe. It's a great encouragement when you find people who are in agreement with you. And maybe they've been doing this for a little while. They might be able to help you out with some of the questions you have and some of the struggles that you are facing and will face in the future. Finally, pray to God a little bit every day. Just a simple, thank you God, the day is great. Or God, I hate this day, please help me. Those simple little prayers God hears, cares about, and will answer. Guys, thank you for giving me 30 minutes of your time. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much for watching this video. I love you very much. God bless you.